going to talk about Philippians 3 today. Uh, last week, Doc <coughs> had mentioned that <clears throat> there would be a very specific point addressed this week. And uh, he never called me to tell me what that was. <laughs> so <clears throat> I thought I knew what it was, though, and I texted him, and it turns out I was right. So uh, we're, I'm going to start right there, and I know what, because, uh, you know, I know what he was talking about. It was Philippians 3.14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul wrote that uh, to the Philippians. Now, um, when I talk about Paul, for people who may not know or anyone watching online or something like that, I always try to briefly point out who Paul was, uh, an ex-Pharisee, hunter of the Christians and persecutor of the Christians that was completely changed and transformed by the risen Christ. That's important. The word risen Christ is in there and turned into uh, a powerful man who gave his life to walking around the known world for serving Christ and spreading the gospel. Now, to get to get a little bit into uh, uh, Philippians 3, I, I want to give you a little bit of background first on Philippi. So you have some, some context of, of what's going on there. Philippi was the first Jesus community started by Paul in Eastern Europe. It was heavily populated with um, retired Roman soldiers and patriots and people like that. So needless to say, when Paul went there, talking about Jesus being the king and things like that, they were resistant, to say the least. And uh, But there were also many, many converts, many people who did in fact, become Christians, and they stayed faithful uh, when Paul left. So that's kind of that's kind of a, it gives you an idea of what what Philippi was like. And and the book of Philippians, when you read it, is not like the other letters that Paul wrote. They're more linear. He he starts off with explaining who he is, and then he has a purpose. And I need to tell you this. But uh, in Philippians, it's more of a collection of thoughts and essays and a point that's repeated and. And, and that's because uh, there was a prompting for him to write this letter. He, didn't, he wasn't just immediately driven to say, I'm going to write the Philippians. The, he was in prison, again, as he often was, for preaching the gospel. And the Philippians sent one of their own, Epaphrodites, uh, to prison to take Paul a financial gift and some encouragement. And, you know, that lifted Paul up and he was, that touched him. And so he, he collected his thoughts together, and he wrote them, first of all, to tell them thank you, and, and also to basically to tell them, uh, to encourage them and say, you know, I know I'm in prison. I know, don't be afraid. Don't let this change you. Don't let this shake your fear. And the points that he made to them was you know, he wanted them to stay true to Christ in Philippians 3. So he, was, he knew he could face death um, at any time he was in prison. He could have been sentenced to death. And, and he wanted the Philippians to understand that doesn't matter. That doesn't, that doesn't change my opinion about Christ. The Christ is why, why I'm here, why I live, and what I preach. And that is, that's the um, Philippians 3.14, what we started with. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of Christ Jesus. Now, the Philippians were experiencing some problems um, First of all, there were a lot of uh, new Christians who were steeped in Jewish traditions, and they were telling people you had to be circumcised, and you got to follow old Jewish laws. And and and, and uh, Paul wanted to let them know that's not no, you don't. You, you need Christ. You accept Christ. That's what you got to do. That's your number one thing. And and he and and they would bring up Paul's past, and they would talk about this. And you can imagine how frustrating that would be. You're in prison. You took the gospel somewhere. You hear it's flourishing. And then you hear other people are walking around talking bad about you and then trying to put their own new rules on, on Christ, on the teachings of Christ. And, and so, you know, Paul, Paul worked hard to set that straight. Um, he talked about his, his previous life. He, Paul addressed his transformation. He talked about Timothy um, and, and the life Timothy led in, in terms of sacrifice. And he even talked about Epaphrodites, the guy I just mentioned, who took him the gifts. That, he got sick and almost died, but he didn't. And God can take all those circumstances. When we go through life suffering for the sake of Christ, we're imitating Christ. And ultimately, what do we get? We get glory, we get kingdom, we get presence with Christ. And that, that, that's the source of Paul's message. Now, I'm going to read from 
Philippians 3, 2 through 14, which is kind of long, and then, and then I'll, I'll paraphrase it in my own words, because this is the core of the message that, that Paul was trying to tell them <clears throat> in terms of you don't have to be circumcised. You just have to accept Christ. You, you, you don't have to follow the Jewish customs. You just have to accept Christ. Christ should be the center of everything. Now, we're going to go, we're going to go out for, uh, I'm going to explain this first line before I get into it. Watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. Now, he's talking about the ones who are come out and trying to put their own agenda into the gospel. You need to follow Jewish traditions. You need to get circumcised. These are the people he's addressing. And this is how, this is, this is the core part of, of his message right here. Watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, the ones who worship by the Spirit of God. Boast in Jesus Christ. Do not put confidence in the flesh, although I have reasons to have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew among Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is the law, blameless. But everything that was gained to me, I've considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ, Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and considered them as dung so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based, <clears throat> excuse me, based on, based on from the law, but one that is through Christ. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Not that I've already reached that goal or am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, do not consider myself to have taken a hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Now, What he's saying is, look, if they're telling you be a good Jew so you'll get to heaven and you can be with Christ, that for, no, because listen, I was the best. I was, a, I was born in the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Jew among Jews. I hunted down these Christians. I, did, I, I, I went after them. I was a Pharisee. I had power. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I did everything. And in terms of the law, I was blameless. I was the man. And that means nothing. What did he call it? Dung. That's, that's a, I mean, that's, that, you know, in the original text, that word is a word that we use. And, you know, it's, it's without being um, um, tacky or inappropriate, it, if you think about it, you're going to say that was what your life was before Christ. That's what he's saying. And, and he's saying, you know, until he knew Christ, he didn't realize that all of that elevation in the, in the world, and everything he was doing was dung. And, and now knowing Christ is his drive forward. And the, 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 the reference that the doc was, was referring to was pressing on towards the goal, the goal of Christ. It connects with the line that, that Paul's used in the past, to, 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 to die as gain, um, to live as Christ, to die as gain, because he's living, he's living for Christ. And that's the, lesson he, that's the lesson he's trying to convey over to the people of Philippi. This life, no matter what you achieve, is done compared to anything unless you are pursuing Christ. So Paul's message in the entire book of Philippians, uh, in, the, in the third chapter in particular, is that we are citizens of heaven. We are to seek the kingdom of heaven. And, and, and while, while they're there in a Roman society in Philippi, and he's not there, and they're hearing things about him, and you know people are going, well, Paul, Paul used to... You know, Paul used to be a Christian killer, and he was a Pharisee. And, I mean, he may have taught you guys about this Jesus stuff, but, you know, he's in prison now. I mean, you're really going to listen to someone like that? And then, and then you've got the Romans there who are saying, oh, that's a bunch of nonsense. And then you've got the new Christians who do have the, 
kind of corrupt belief believers in them going to you and going, look, um, you know, you can't really get to heaven unless you're circumcised. All that chaos is gone. And just think, if, if it would be like if Doc came in here and delivered a good sermon and went home and, and he found out nobody even listened, everyone had earplugs, it would be frustrating. And, and uh, Paul wasn't so much convinced that people, people weren't going to hold the message of the gospel and hold the message of Christ. He wanted to reinforce, look, I'm in prison and I'm, I could be killed. And you know what? I don't even care. I mean, I care about my relationship with Christ. His idea was living is, is suffering. Dying is to be with Christ. Because if you die, you're in the presence of Christ. And if you live, you are suffering to spread the gospel for Christ. So that, that's why it, it, he, he compared the entire book of Philippians. If you take, if you take one theme that goes over it, it's, it's to compare um, how we should mirror the life of Christ. Christ did not seek exaltation and uplifting in his title. He didn't, he didn't go around going, I'm the son of God. He did uh, get down and worship. And get, no, yeah, that's not how Jesus did things. Jesus was a servant. He came into the world. He served. He served God. He, he, he died for everyone's sins. Paul looked at Timothy and Epaphrodites and, and in the third chapter, his own life and tried to mirror that. He said, this is what you're supposed to do. This is how you go through life. You go through life imitating what Christ did to the best of your ability. You're not Jesus, but you cling to Jesus, and you cling to what Jesus did. This is the gain you get in life. This is what makes life meaningful. Until you get to the point where you go to be with Christ, all your efforts should be taking people with you. I was, told, I was talking to Eddie Spires one time in here. We were talking about prison ministry and different things, and I said, you know what we do? Our, our door, our job in life is to hold the door open for other people <laughs> in the kingdom of heaven, to get to heaven. We're basically keeping the doors open, going, get in here. I mean, I know, I know that's kind of a simple analogy, but that's what our job is. That's what Paul does. And he considers all of the, uh, the elevation and the titles and the prestige and the things he had before. He called, Dung's a powerful, I mean, you know, you, you, some people say, well, my life didn't have meaning. Paul took it to the next level when he described what his life was before. And he was, a, he was a, quite an authority figure. The message of Philippians chapter 3 is, an, it is, is very powerful. I press toward the mark or the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He talked about imitating Christ and used his life as, the own, as his own example. And, and on that note, I, I would say, you know, people, are, what's the life application? You know, a lot of people struggle when we talk about things in the Bible. They say, well, realistically, in this busy world, how do I apply a message like that? I don't walk around preaching and starting churches and having people hand me money so I can eat and give me places to stay. And some people struggle how to envision applying something like that into your life in the world we live in now. The application is, is really simple. Um, it's, it's not as hard as we may think. It's not hard to take uh, messages from the Bible and apply them into your own life. When you read the Bible, and I know I'm always talking about reading the Bible, something occurs inside of you. When we read, when you, we read Philippians and we see Paul, this passionate person, and these words get inside you, we become conscious of people we interact with. We become conscious of the world we interact with. We become conscious of how we spend our time. People say, I don't have a lot of time. Uh, you know, everyone has, your time is managed by someone. If it's not you, it's being managed by another person. And we all have to be responsible for who is managing our time. And we, we take collectively every event in our life, everything we do and every interaction, and, and we think with Christ first. And when we, when we do that, that is, that, is, that is living the way Paul was talking about. Of course, with the intention, the added intention of spreading the gospel. Um, and... You know, I, I do that all day long. I mean, and I'm sure most of you do too. You're con we're convicted when we say something wrong. I say something and say, ah, oh, I shouldn't have said that. That's probably the thing I say the most. And, <laughs> and um, I don't really do a lot of things that I, that I, that I regret. I don't, I don't go through the day at the end of the day and thinking I shouldn't have done this or I shouldn't have done that. But, but I think there are things I say I, I wish I could take back. And when we apply these sensibilities, you know, I, I always tell people, um, when, when you're discussing the Bible with a non-believer and they struggle to believe it, to understand it, and they go, ah, oh, that's just, that's, that's crazy, man. 
what, what they're really struggling with is their own picture of it, their own imagination of it, their own, the way they're seeing it, because uh, it, it, they've painted a picture of, of what it looks like, like a cartoon, which is, we, we've talked about before, why people don't, don't believe in, in um, God, Satan, and the events of the Bible, because they're picturing this cartoon play out in their head with a pitchfork and a guy on a cloud that doesn't want us to have any fun and things like that. A lot of people aren't really struggling with the Word of God. They're struggling with their own imagination and the way they're seeing it. Because, it's a, in my opinion, it's impossible to see it clearly until you read it yourself. Because the words do affect you. It's, it's, it's wonderful to talk to somebody about the Bible. And I love, I love doing this. And, and it's wonderful to come and listen to someone say it. But it, I cannot tell you how deeply profound and moving it is if reading it yourself. I mean... You know, when I, when I discuss this with people, particularly in, in this book, because this is, this is one of the sharpest points in the Bible. This is one of the sharpest points in the Bible, Philippians 3, about how my entire life is garbage compared to what I am in Christ. That, that's, that's, this, is a, this, is, this isn't just, you know, there's a lot of book of the Bible people gloss through, like, ah, book of Numbers, yeah, couldn't put that one down. That was a page turner. Um, <laughs> But, well, to, to a lot of, and I, I'm not putting down the book of Numbers. Everything has its place. The Bible is equally as important, but in terms of a broad message that people can really latch on to right away, uh, the book of Philippians makes a uh, profound statement and, and why that is important. And, and you do see that. The more, it's funny, the more you, you have fellowship and work with people and you see lives touched, the more you realize that when Paul was talking, I pressed toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You, the more you press towards that, the more your own life changes. The more you, you follow this philosophy of Philippians 3.14, the more life improves. Kenny just had a bunch of people show up to help him move. Debbie, a bunch of people just showed up and bailed me out. I got in a bunch. I had to, move, I had to get out right now. Um, I, I, I helped out some people in church with, you know, some issues where they had, you get God's people, God's energy works through God's people to help each other. And it's amazing. It's I, it, it, pay it forward, pay it forward. Those are the rewards that pay off in the kingdom of God. All he's saying is, trust me. And, and, and Paul realized that in spades. And that's why he dedicated and gave his life to Christ, because that is life. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3.14. Our true citizenship is in heaven. That's Philippians 3.20. So anything that happens here... As long as you're serving Christ, anything else is pretty irrelevant. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this day. Thank you for our time. Thank you for our fellowship. Thank you for your tremendous blessings over all of us, over all of our families. Thank you for the new arrivals. Thank you for the arrivals that will be here soon. Uh, thank you for your exhausting, never-ending patience that you have with us and recognizing that we're all in different places with our walk. And let us never judge each other in that, but only extend our arms. Father, I pray that these words and this message and this, this, this thought of, of life being meaningless without you, I, I pray that this thought dwells in all of our hearts and remains there and has an active, uh, an active action in our lives to reach out to others and to glorify you the kingdom of heaven, God's people all said, and So I shout out your name from the rooftops I proclaim that I am